Hello, hello. Welcome to the Story Darlings podcast. I'm Sandra. And I'm Tara. And what are we talking about today, Tara? We are talking about part two of Assassin's Blade, which is the Assassin and the Underworld and the Assassin and the Empire. Yeah, so if you missed last week's discussion, we talked about the first three short stories in the Assassin's Blade collection. And so we are jumping back into where Selena is. And this part, Underworld, begins with Selena and Sam coming back and getting back into Arabin's good graces, I guess. He does something which is like so classic domestic abuser type of thing, which is like showering Selena in presents and trying to like apologize in a very shallow kind of manner. He goes out of his way to give her a new suit, which she uses the spider silk that she had gotten in the Red Desert to get that tailored in over the heart of the uniform for extra protection there. She finds out what happened with Sam specifically. You want to go into a little bit about how Sam's time was away from Selena? So Sam, A, he was forced to watch her be beat, but then he was also kind of taken off the rotation for the jobs and given a, in his eyes, very demeaning job of basically babysitting Lysandra and helping her with her coming out party. It's a point with Selena because she doesn't know that this was his punishment, but she thinks he's doing this because he likes Lysandra and Lysandra is a future courtier not courtier, courtesan, and she is about to have her virginity auctioned off. She is supposed to be one of the highest grossing virginities, which is just, yeah. Anyway, Selena can't stand her, cannot stand her. And so the fact that she is all over Sam and Sam is kind of doing her bidding just hits Selena wrong. And so that's a point of contention between Sam and Selena because Sam's like, hasn't told her that he didn't have a choice in this, but he didn't have a choice in it. And Selena is holding it against him after everything. It's kind of fun seeing Selena be the super jealous Mm -hmm. one. (laughs) Of all the crap that she would give, like Dorian and Kaol in the first few books that we read in the series. Lysandra is totally aware of what she's doing. She is just like having her own type of fun, the egging Selena on. There's also a point where Sam mentions that Lysandra just wants Selena to acknowledge her. It seems like Sam thinks, and Sam is a boy, so he doesn't understand... <laughs> all of the nuances of girl like against girl. Sam is in the the mind thought that Lysandra looks up to Selena kind of and that's the reason she's being bitchy is because Selena won't reciprocate that. Selena's like I still can't stand her. I don't give a shit why she's doing it. I can't stand her. The dynamic with Lysander is so interesting because on one hand, I feel really bad for her to be, it's kind of like that scene from Taken whenever his daughter's put up for auction. And so I feel for Lysandra in the sense that she's just going to be put on parade for these despicable human beings to just go to the biggest bid like an auctioneer, like she's a livestock or something. Also, Arabin has been using Lysandra as a tool to get back at Selena, as if that would bug her. Like he is just parading around with Lysandra. There's a scene that was kind of like Pretty Woman to me when they go to the orchestra and Selena is watching Arabin in his box with Lysandra at his side where she used to sit. She is like trying her best to ignore them and focusing on the show and it's bringing her to tears because it's so emotional and she can't get that song out of the head, which ends up being a cool little detail in an earlier book with Dorian. I also, I don't think Lysandra cares. Like, I don't think it's offensive to her that her virginity is being auctioned off. I think she likes that. I think she likes the power or the prestige that comes from being what she is. Unlike the Taken scene where she was kidnapped and forced into that, I think Lysandra eggs it on and is enjoying it. And so I don't feel so much sorry for her because my impression of her, if she was given the choice, she would choose where she is right now. That's an interesting take on Lysandra because there's definitely like a form of exploitation going on. So even if she accepts like, oh, this is prestigious for me and this is what I want out of my life, there's still that level of exploitation that's really dirty and she's just not privy to that yet. Like she's not in it maturity to really know what's happening to her. Yeah, it's a different kind of hatred than, say, Sam's mother. I, in my head, likened it to, like, 
in way back times where it was her season, like the ton and stuff, that was their coming out and they're of age and now they're marriageable. In her case, though, it's you're buying her virginity. They're auctionable in Lysandra's case. But like, that's what I was picturing in my head. She was having like her season. And that's what Sam was helping with is make sure that that like went well. And she had a whole lot of suitors who were willing to pay. In true Throne of Glass fashion, there's yet another party. And this time it is the Harvest Moon Gala that Selena, I don't know if Sam ended up going to this, but Selena definitely goes. There's some fun cameos. And the interesting thing is Selena went to this Harvest Moon Gala as a cover for a job that she accepted. It's for a woman named Leaf, Leafer, Leafer, mm-hmm. Leafer, and she is like the estranged ex-wife or whatever of Donovan. Mm-hmm. Is that his name? And Donovan is allegedly a slave trade sympathizer kind of man. The job that he is on is creating a slave road from their country to Otterlin. This is like exactly up Selena's alley to get her buy-in because she is against anything slave trade related. Well, and he was also going to sell documents that were supposedly containing information about slave trade like anti-sympathizers so like the ones that are trying to end the slave trade so she wanted those documents where they couldn't be turned over to the king and those people killed for trying to free the slaves so with this job selena goes to this harvest moon gala to kind of disguise herself and she takes the name diana which is interesting that is her cover name because of everything that we know about you know her so far from reading the other books and she does get her five minutes or whatever audience with donovan while he is sitting in this vip section at a club with all of these young girls draped around him and things like that and she just goes up there there and acts like this ditzy little thing talking to him on behalf of her father who is a big fan i know you mentioned that there were a lot of cameos and i caught on to one and i don't know if it's who i think it was but there was one where it was a group of guys and there was one that was less serious and one that was very serious and looking around is that dorian and kale yeah okay Mm -hmm. because the one like wanted to dance with her or something and then the other one's like and I'm like, that is totally Dorian and Kale, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's the classic Kale mean mugging anyone that isn't on the prince's level. I think it described his eyes, like his sapphire eyes from behind the mask or whatever, because it was another mask kind of ball, mm-hmm. which is so convenient for Dorian. But I loved seeing young Dorian and Kale, like, <laughs> like way back before all this shit happens in the later books that we've read, which is so fun. I feel like Sam was there and he got super like jealous mm-hmm. or something. Thing of Dorian, right? Yes. Like he was just sassy at him. Yes. He was there. This is the point where Sam also, he knows her love of the theater and her love of that music that made her cry. And he gives her a very, very nice present of that music's like music sheets so that she can play it in between her getting to go to the theater, which just crushed me because that is the music that I'm thinking that she is playing when Dorian comes in and he's like, oh, this is about a lover. And she's like, well, yes. And like Dorian gets all jealous, but she is so moved by this music and she was moved in the first place, but now she has another tie to it, which is Sam. So it's just another little like masochistic moment of Sarah J. Mass, where it's like, oh, it hurts so good. <laughs> it hurts so good. Yeah, that one really tugs at the heartstrings. So it's after this, she is to meet with Donovan, and her cover is blown. Like, Donovan finds out that she isn't who she says she is. No, right? Donovan doesn't, but she goes into his house to kind of snoop and she gets caught by his bodyguard. And his bodyguard is the one that traps her in like the sewer. Philip. Yes. And so she gets trapped in the sewer and Sam, who she had told not to look for her because she would be fine and she's got it and she's the assassin of Otterlin and all this stuff. But he still comes to look for her and ends up saving her from drowning in a waste trash filled sewer, which is disgusting. (laughs) 
Yes. So Sam comes and saves her, which is just a little knock in her ego too. Two knocks because she got trapped in the sewer by this dude and almost died. But then Sam had to save her. So her ego is not doing well after this. Yeah, that scene was so gross because she's literally in like this little confined space and she can't get like the The opening to the street busted open. And the water level is rising and it's like a cut scene of her like taking a deep breath and just submerging herself in this nasty refuse sewage water but sam saves her he finds like a someone nearby who has like the big lever to like help heave it open and i thought the scene after it when she's like taking so many hot baths to like rinse herself making herself vomit to like get everything out of her system so and gross. Sam's lying to that after he's like, are you done taking showers? Like, there's no more hot water. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> just like add injury. Just just keep keep it. And then we see her get pissed off with Arabin. I think it was because of Lysandra because Arabin is like flaunting that. But she got pissed off at Arabin and she finally pays him off and is like, peace, dude, I'm leaving. Right? Yes, finally. She's like, I'll keep taking like orders or whatever. Contracts, that's the word I was looking for. She'll keep taking contracts, but she is done being at his beck and call. And he doesn't let it show very much, but this irritates him. And so she's... She moves out and Sam comes with her. They end up kind of moving it quickly. I mean, they've known each other for years and years and years. And we come to know that Sam has been in love with Selena for a number of years and was too afraid to tell her. And we also see that Sam kind of forced her hand in that a little bit in the moving in phase because he's like, I'm just going to go to Benjali because I can't stay here with Arabin and see him do what he's doing to you. And so I'm just I'm just leaving. You're always going to pick him over me and I can't take that anymore. And Selena's like, "What the fuck? No. No, you don't get to leave me. I choose you." And I loved it. We also find out that the whole deal between Arabin and Sam that kind of calmed things down, at least from Sam's standpoint, was the only thing that he asked for from Arabin was to not hurt Selena again, and he would forgive Arabin for what he did. Like, that was the only thing he asked for. So selfless. And he resents Selena just coming back and forgiving him and his impression because Arabin gave her gifts. And he's like, all I want is for you not to be hurt and all you're wanting is for him to give you gifts and then fall right back into the pattern that you had and I can't live with that yeah which it's understandable right Mm -hmm. because you feel like Selena goes through all this growth in the red desert after what the master tells her about Arabin and you know her being used and Arabin will never care about her and that sort of thing and then she gets back to Rifthold and she just keeps putting off paying Arabin off for herself and then you know later for Sam but yeah well and she's been so groomed though like her whole life Mm -hmm. has been groomed by Arabin and so that part's also understandable how it's hard to like break you know basically 19 years of conditioning by Arabin and just like break it and so it took Sam telling her that he loved her and Sam being there for her for her to finally be able to break that and see love versus whatever Arabin had for her. It was definitely like the domestic violence situations you hear about these women that are always trying to get away from their husbands and it takes them try and try and try again to finally be able to do that. But yeah, so with this whole, you know, leafer contract to put a stop to Donovan. There is a deal that's going down, like an exchange between Donovan and some a supposed, you know, business deal guy. And Selena intervenes and documents are supposed to get exchanged and all of this with names and locations for people that are against the slave trade. And she does kill Donovan, mm-hmm. like by her own hand, right? It's the other guy that, that was with himself. Yeah, like kills himself um, that was holding all these paperwork and trying to get away from Selena. And so she at first kills Donovan in the room. And this is after she's gotten some of the documents, I think, but she doesn't know what's in them yet. And so she kills Donovan and then 
she chases after the guy he was meeting. And in that chase, that guy ends up like swallowing what I view as very similar to like a cyanide tablet, you know, and he ends up dying. And there's a point because she also kills Philip, right? And there's a point where Philip's like, you're wrong. Like, that's not what he stands for. He loves his country. And she just kind of like, eh a well to that and then goes and kills him and then chases and then she sees that the other guy had lit his documents on fire but she sees the bottom part of it or a piece of it and it indicates that this is not people who were wanting to like the sympathizers you know like he wasn't going to turn over the documents of sympathizers he was going to turn over documents or not really turn over, but they were working together for these sympathizers. So they were on the right side and she just killed them for Arabin. And she also knows that Arabin knew what was happening. And she finds that out because she goes back to Arabin and tells him that it's done. And Arabin's like, well, did you look at the documents? And she's like, no. But then he says something and she's like, he knew. He knew he was sending me there. And that Leifer was the one that was trying to get rid of the sympathizers. And that the road is actually going in place to be able to traffic these people to the places that the king wants them. And so she is beside herself mad that she was just used. And then that's where Erwin also buys Lysandra using her money that she gave him to buy her freedom. And so basically her blood money is used to buy the person that she can't stand the most. Most. And so it's just another jab by Arabin, just another like, I don't care kind of moment. And he knows it again. He's doing it on purpose just to irritate her. This was a huge learning for Selena because I feel like this might have been the first time where she was on a job and she found out that, okay, maybe these despicable, disgusting human beings who do things that I don't agree with are also capable of working toward the greater good in some sense, like just so much gray area. And so that was interesting that I thought that she had to grapple with that. But yes, what a slap in the face for Arabin to just use up all of the money. Basically, this is almost all of the money that she got from the master in the Red Desert to pay for her and Sam. So the end of the Underworld short story ends with Sam and Selena just kind of hanging out at their apartment that they share together. And they are still hopeful. They're still hopeful. They have a plan. They're going to keep working and just try and get a better life and stick it out with each other. Well, and we find out one other thing in this short story, which I thought was very significant, is that spider silk that was so valuable. And Sandra mentioned it was put in a suit, but it was not put in Selena's suit. It was put in Sam's suit to guard his heart. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Again, like her love language is sacrifice. She sacrificed not only the thing that was worth so much money, but it could have protected her. And instead she wanted it to protect him. And it got me. It got me so hard. I love that you worded it that way, that these little actions and favors that she does in that sense is her love language because in The Assassin and the Empire, which is the last book in The Assassin's Blade, we hear Sam tell Selena that he loves her. Like, I love you. He says it like so many times to her and not once does she say it to him, which we kind of learn about why that is so. The Assassin and the Empire, it begins with a prologue chapter, which is called After. And it is essentially Selena sitting in a carriage being carted off to the salt mines after everything has happened. And then the next chapter, it takes place about a month after the events of the Underworld. And again, Selena is at the orchestra and she comes back to the apartment sees a note that Sam left and he just tells her that he is out she already knows what Sam is doing so she leaves the apartment to head over to the vaults which we've seen in the past in a previous reading and Sam is in the fighting ring like he has been doing these fights in the pit to try and earn money so they could have a better life. She is not happy about this. She is in her mind so pissed off that he's putting himself in danger. And then also she's like, well, if I got in that ring, like they would get a real show. And thinking about like just beating him because he's doing this. And I found that kind of funny because like she's mad because he's going to get hurt. But she's also thinking I will beat you. She's so confident. 
I mean, this is a pretty bad place. You learn in the Empire short story that the vaults, not only is this the place where Grave was hanging out from the previous book before she just absolutely massacred him in the alley, which was so good. But the vaults has... Go ahead. Well, I was just going to point out that's another like catchphrase for Sarah J. Mass- massacre. Like... <laughs> Oh my God. You have your marketing cap on. I know. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> Masochist and massacre. I love it. <laughs> Back to the vaults. No, this is the same place where Grave was hanging out. Now Sam is doing fights here for money. And you learn that there is like some prostitution going on. There's like little side rooms that have these tattered curtains where you can still see the shit that's happening in there and these women are just like on the clock all day every day and i feel more sorry for these women than i do for like the lysandras because these women you get a sense that they don't want to be there they're like not well taken care of at all and they are forced to just do whatever somebody who walks in says and at least with like Lysandra and the high end prostitutes like they're taken care of they get a little bit of say in what they do and stuff so yeah I get a sense that this is the like world that Sam's mom may have been a part of but also Arabin was one of her clients so she may have been a little bit higher end too I don't know you know these are the like daughter from Taken that have been kidnapped or the whatever and are sold into it, I think. Yeah, just whatever dirty, filthy person off the street to use however they want, Mm -hmm. which was exactly what happened to Sam's mom when she was killed after something went horribly bad. And so this book, Selena and Sam want to take their separation from Arabin a step further, which is to collect enough money to now completely break off from him. So they seek an audience with him, and now they want to stop being a part of his guild, but they also want his blessing to be able to set up like a smaller, like do their own thing, like in the Southern continent as assassins. Well, and Arabin being the dick that he is, because at first, like they weren't collecting money for that. They were collecting money to like live and to make the trip and whatever. And Arabin being a dick that he is, is like, well, I'm going to charge you a fee, like a parting fee for you to be able to leave a my guild and then also then be able to set up your own because you're two of my top earners. So you can't just leave. And so that is the fee that Selena wants to pay because she still has some money. And so she's like, I'll just pay it. And Sam's like, no. And it was one of those like scenes where Selena is calling him on like misogyny because she's like, what is it because I'm paying it? Like, get over yourself. Let's just get out. And then we can argue over who pays for shit. And Sam's like, no, let's just do one more contract. And before Sam was the one against doing one more contract. Selena was the one wanting to do one more contract. And so now they're both together on the doing one more contract because Sam wants to pay his own way out. And he doesn't want Selena to keep paying for his stuff. And so now they are in agreement on doing one more contract. And that contract turns out to be to kill Iowan Jane, who is the like drug king pin mob he's the person, crime lord, crime lord, lord whatever and his second who is Farron, who we've met previously yeah. and they run the vaults by the way like the vaults is their stomping ground so after selena and sam are out so much money to finally just let go of arabin they are very hard up for money so sam goes out and he gets this job this one last job and it's under very shady circumstances like it's a cloaked figure that comes you know to Sam and they make this deal together but Selena and Sam are feeling very confident about it and taking them down so they do a lot of recon work you know trailing Farron trailing Jane and there's one scene where she follows them to the vaults and you can see that Farron is a bad bad mofo like people are scared of him there's something like very like especially dark about him and how people kind of just cower from him in this place and like keep away well and you also see he's a bit of a sadist so he enjoys the pain that he inflicts on people and he tries to do the most that he possibly can to a person which is just disgusting but that is the type of person he is 
Yeah, Selena sees him meeting with a guy that is indebted to him who has been like not been able to pay him back and keeps lying about getting him back his money and stuff. And so Farron takes him down below because apparently in the bottom of the vaults are just these locked up rooms where they torture people and do all of that stuff. And so he takes him down there. You immediately just hear screaming as the guy is tortured. And then the bar keep like they start playing like music and stuff to drown out the guy's screams. And that's pretty much that scene. But after all of this, Elena is still feeling good about her ability to kill Farron and Jane. And there's a part in that scene where Selena mentions that, like, basically the person is okay at that point in time because if he wasn't okay, his, like, screams would be different because people blow out their vocal cords at a certain point in torture. And that scene just, like, was horrific. And the fact that Selena knew that, it just brought you back to the fact that she has done horrible things as well. And so they're kind of on par. She she doesn't enjoy it, like, Baron does, but they're on par with doing bad things in the past. Yeah, I'm glad that you called attention to that because there was a scene between Selena and Sam where she is like second guessing the things that they have been doing over the years. And Sam basically tries to comfort her and ease her mind like we are not like Jane and Farron because the difference is we don't, you know, get a kick out of it. We don't get a rise out of it. And so that helps a little bit. But it's after this scene with the vaults, Arabin decides to just make himself at home and breaks into their apartment while Sam is out. And I hated this scene so much because just the audacity of Arabin to come into her safe place that she has established for herself, paid for by herself, and to just act like he is having so much remorse and feels bad and Selena was just so important to him. And he kind of tries to make it seem like he loved her or Mm -hmm. something. You remember that? Well, I was just like, what a piece of shit. And there are call outs to the fact that they never became lovers, but that is kind of what they were like heading towards kind of thing like she made a couple call outs of like it never became that but that is kind of the conditioning that she got and you see that in him like he says he loves her and he's just a creepy like groomer and he lost his favorite toy and so now he's got to try and get it back and it's just a disgusting scene where you see into the mind of Arabin and his manipulation That was one thing that was like so strange reading from Selena's POV because everything is seen through her lens, right? But there were so many times when Arabin is described on pages like handsome and has really gorgeous eyes and things like that. And you know that Selena is like her perspective, how she sees him at times. But no, it was totally that groomer, just icky kind of relationship between them. Because isn't he like 25 years older than her too? I don't, I mean, he's just- I don't remember how old he was, but I got the sense that he wasn't He's not middle-aged, but he's older. Older. Yeah. It's gross. And Selena, being Selena, decides not to tell Sam about this little visit because in her mind is like, why let him worry? One of the next scenes is a conversation that I loved between Selena and Sam. Selena asks Sam, tell me your deepest secret. And he shares with her that it was keeping it a secret that he loved her for like the longest time. He was afraid that they were going to exit each other's lives and she would have never known. He wouldn't have been able to like let her know. Then he turns the question on her and all of us readers were probably reading like, oh, this is the part where she's going to like tell him that, you know, her actual roots in Terrison. And she doesn't. What does she say? Her deepest secret is... That she's a coward. I mean, I guess that is her deepest secret to her because she keeps hiding that even past where we are in the book series right now. Like she finally got over being a coward. And that was after she had told who she was to Kale. Like that being a coward is her deepest, darkest secret. We see her be a coward whenever she doesn't tell Sam that she loves him back. You know, she always just says like some other random comment or something every time Sam tells her I love you. So we see her being a coward in that kind of sense. But as you said, like in the other books, she's constantly hiding this stuff. But it's almost like for her to finally put it all out there and to embrace it, there's going to be so much responsibility that is going to weigh her down as soon as it's out there. She's going to be responsible for so 
so many lives. And the idea of that has to be very terrifying to her. Well, and the fact that she has to then cope with the lives that were lost because of her. I think that that's the part that she can't handle at this point in time is how many lives were lost because of her and to to save her. But also in that scene, we get a very touching moment between Sam and Selena, where Sam comes back from the revelation that she is a coward with, well, when I'm scared, I say I am Sam Cortland and I am not afraid. And if you remember from the previous books, that is Selena's catchphrase when she is afraid is I am Selena Sardothian and I will not be afraid or I am not afraid or whatever. And that came from Sam. Again, one of those like, not a sacrifice, but like a touching kind of revelation between those two. It just adds so much depth to her character and what she's been through and the people that left a mark on her. Even their names, like I never noticed that their initials were just flip-flopped with (laughs) S and C and then Selena, you know what I mean? And so when she says that phrase and I will not be afraid, it's just... Mm. It's like another little chef kiss, Sarah J. Mass. Yeah, I love that scene too. That was a favorite. And then we go to the scene where she is. <laughs> Did were you gonna say something? No, I'm like, is this the scene mm-hmm. where she's like waiting? And so then we go to the scene where Sam heads out to do his part of the contract, which is to kill Farron, the second in command. And that opens up Selena to be able to kill Jane. So Sam leaves and he tells her not to come looking for him, that he will be back at a certain time. And so you see Selena just pacing back and forth, back and forth, back back and forth and Sam never shows up and it turns to like noon the next day and Sam is still not there and she gets a knock at the door and she's like okay fine finally Sam's back he's fine he just had to like you know lose people or whatever he's fine but it is not Sam it is Arabin and Arabin says that they left Sam's body at the keep because they thought he still lived there or something along those lines and so you see Selena rushing off to go find Sam and his body and every other person in the keep is just distraught because Sam was a good guy. Everybody liked him. And Erebin's not so much. Erebin's like his little dicky self. And then Selena overhears somebody talking outside her room about how they are going to go and pay back the death of Sam and how there's a window that's going to be left open and whatever. And so Selena goes out her window and she is going to seek her revenge and go through that window. So she does. And she goes to attack and she does end up killing Jane, which leaves Farron alive. And Farron basically gasses her and she is not able to kill Farron. And then he takes her to the king who sentences her to being a slave in in Dovier. When Selena got the news that Sam had been killed on this job to get Farron, a part of her kind of dies in that moment. Like everything gets quiet. She gets very detached, rushes over to the assassin's keep, goes down where they keep, you know, prisoners and other and bodies and stuff, looks at Sam's body, and he is almost completely unrecognizable from Um, the time spent there like she still knows it's Sam but I mean everything is fucked up on him his fingers his skin is cut up eyes were taken out like she could tell that Farron had a good time yes she smells something weird on like some kind of musk is what she says like she can still smell you know that it's Sam but it smells different and so she just gets kind of dead to the world for a little while that's when she's placed into her old bedroom which then she wakes up and finds the Arabin had changed the locks on the door to lock from the outside rather than the inside and it's almost like this big staged event where she comes to she's locked in she overhears this conversation where people are like oh yeah you know Arabin and company we're gonna take back you know what happened to Sam. And so they kind of paved the way for her to like, okay, I'm going to seek revenge. So when she dives out the window, pretty much, and the personal guard of Arabin, Wesley stops her. He is like, he wants to tell her what's really happening, but she's so emotional and driven by revenge and needing to like go pay for this crime that happened that she just runs off and doesn't even hear him out. Mm-hmm. 
And so she falls right into that trap. And the musk scent that she smelled on Sam's body, it had been the Gloriella poison that was used as the gas um, to knock her out there. So two things. The part where I could tell that she was just destroyed by what happened to Sam is there is this like a part in that scene where she mentions that he still smells like Sam. He smells like the cheap soap she made him use because she wouldn't let him use her expensive stuff. And I'm like, that is something that you think about like when you're completely distraught and destroyed, like what you didn't do, what you kept that person from experiencing and the selfish moments you had that took away from their life. And so she is thinking about the things that she didn't let him do and the things that she didn't do for him. And and that just destroyed me. And then the second thing is that seems like a pattern with her not listening to people and just doing like ignoring them because she did that with Philip too before she killed Donovan. And then she did it with Wesley. Like she didn't let him finish. And if he had finished either one of them, like she would have known what she was about to do was the wrong move and that she was playing into the bad people's side. Selena could use a little bit of learning in the art of hearing people out, whether or not you want to believe them, but hearing them out. Yeah, it makes you wonder why she does that. Act first and then think about it later. I think that that is a part of her ego. I think her ego is taking over a little bit there and like, no, I'm right, you're wrong, moving on. Yeah, I know I know you hate Kaol and <laughs> I'm gonna hate me making this comparison, but it's like, if you look at Kaol and Selena, they both have very like righteous views of themselves, right? Very different ways. Like Kaol is very empire, honor centric, whereas Selena is very much her own abilities type of thing. But it's so stubborn that it keeps them from hearing out things that they need to hear. Well, and I agree with you on that. Like they are very much alike, which is also probably one of the reasons that they would not have worked well as a couple. But I think Kale, his righteousness doesn't stem from him being right. It stems from him thinking the people that he trusts are right. And that is the difference because Selena doesn't trust anybody. She trusts herself and what she thinks is right. So I still see Kale as a puppet, even in his righteousness, where Selena is Mm -hmm. no one's puppet. She may be wrong, but she's going to be wrong on her own. I agree with you that they are similar, but I think that the difference in them is what makes my opinion of Kale so much worse than my opinion of Selena because she at least uses her brain, whereas Kale just goes and like doesn't. Yeah, you see a lot of just the trust issues that Selena has and how much she has had to rely on herself and her own discretion. I um, I don't know when you brought up Kale. It made me think of the cameo when they're at the gala and even how Sarah J. Mass like wrote Selena's perspective on like how she sees Kale is just this like stern guy and then throne of glass we know chapter one it opens with selena just like hating kale and imagining all the ways that she's gonna kill him and stuff it was like i loved how that fit together how she looked at him i'm wondering if they recognized each other a little bit when they first met in throne of glass like if there was some spark of like recognition that I've met you before. Mm -hmm. Like I know Dorian does, but I think that that stemmed back from childhood, not from a year before when they met. But I wonder if there was any kind of a subconscious, like, like, do I know you like deja vu moment or anything? Totally. So we see her getting sent to Indiovir and the king being the king, douchiness, like just out the wazoo. (laughs) douche lord <laughs> yes. um and so he basically she kind of makes a comment that the king interprets as she wants it to be quick her death and he's like you know no i'm not going to give you what you want i'm going to send you to endovir and tell them to keep you alive as long as they possibly can so you have to suffer even longer and so she's sent over there we see that and then we get a cut scene to Arabin watching her being taken to endovir and beside him is fucking Farron. And <laughs> fucking Farron. <laughs> Sorry, that then reminded me of um, fucking Trevor. Hey, honey, good to see you. How you been? Fucking Trevor. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> fucking the <Farron>. after series. <laughs> and 
they had worked together to make all of this happen. Like, Arabin had promised Farron the crime lord, like, boss position. And Farron had promised Arabin that he would get Sam taken away. Like, he would get Sam out of the picture. Because Arabin, being the douche-tastic person that he is, didn't want his favorite toy to be taken away. And his line at the very end is, I don't share my things. And I'm like, oh, I hope when she comes back looking for that necklace that she lost when she was eight, she massacres you like she did Grave because you fucking A, like are such a horrible (laughs) person. And we also hear that Arabin had planned to rescue her from like basically the gallows when she was put to death. And Farron's asking him, why aren't you going after her? This is a much easier takedown than going into the king's like, you know, place where he murders people. Like, why aren't you going after him? And Arabin's like, I don't share my things. He he wants her to suffer. I hate Arabin. I hate him. Like, I think he's one of the, like, people I hate most besides the king. The king and Arabin. They're supposed to be these father <laughs> figures. And they're supposed to care about the people. And they just fucking don't. I hate him. I'm with you. After they killed Sam that way, I was just like, I hope you die in the worst way possible at some point. It's just awful. Sam was such a pure character. He was very grounding for Selena and taught her things that she needed to know at that point in her life. And he was the love that she deserved. He knew that sacrifice was how she felt loved and he did it and she did the sacrifices for him. It was just an equal relationship that they both came in with a lot of baggage and they understood that and they cared about each other still. I don't know if I'll ever understand why she waited so long to go after Sam because I mean, she's just pacing and pacing and waiting and staring at the clock and da 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 and he even said a certain time that he would be back by and it comes and goes and she is still just like beside herself. So I'll never really understand why she... I think that that was a sign of respect from her. He said he had it and for her to go after him would be her saying, I didn't trust you. I didn't trust that you had it. I didn't trust that you were capable of doing this. And you see the sense of them kind of bickering that he's the second and she's obviously better than him. And you see that he doesn't want to live like that. He wants to be on equal footing with her. And so I think that that's her sign of respect that you are equal with me. I trust that you can do what you said you could do. And if I go and look for you right now, that's me saying, I didn't trust that you could do it. Which is interesting because the same kind of thing happened, but reverse mm-hmm. whenever he went looking for her with the sewers. So it's almost like the difference between what Sam and Selena hold is more important. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like Selena, um, reputation and ability and self-reliance is very, very esteemed, like very important to her. Whereas Sam, it's like, I mean, from the beginning, he's been like, no, we shouldn't just kill them. No, we need to like help them. Like he's like very much about the relational aspect of something. But it's also, I think, part of the like, she has always been number one. Sam has always been number two. For him to go and rescue her, she's number one. She knows she's better than him. So it wasn't putting her down for him to help her. Whereas I think for Sam, he's number two and he knows it and she knows it. And that was the one thing that he wanted to be is equal. I think that that just took on another connotation because of the dynamics that were already present. It can't be the same for both of them because there's already a dynamic that contradicts them being the same. And so with Selena being carted off for her sentencing in Endovir, it's like a couple week journey there. At one point, she looks out and sees a white stag, which is the symbol of her homeland, Terrison. And she saves the stag in a way, banging on the the carriage to kind of scare it away before it can get killed by all the guards attending with her. But then we get the touching closing scene where she is resonating those words that Sam had shared with her when she is feeling like a coward, feeling very scared. And she says, my name is Selena Sardathian and I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid. And like, that's how the end of the story. And then the story continues from Throne of Glass onward. And next week we will be discussing the first part in Queen of Shadows. Is that Mm -hmm. the next book? Okay. And yes, I know I said 
before that I was really looking forward to this and I was upset that we were having to read this other book in between because I wanted the mayhem and the carnage and the like massacres to go on. But this book just gave me another reason because at the end of the last book, I still felt a little a little sympathy to Arabin. Like he hadn't shown his true colors yet in like the throne of glass part, you know, because we hadn't heard very much from him. But now I really want her to take her rage out on him too. And so when we left off of the last book, she was going to find her necklace from him. And it was very like, I'm just going to go find it, not I'm going to go murder him and carnage will ensue with Arabin. Carnage is going to ensue with other people. But you didn't get the sense that Arabin was on her shit list or I didn't get that sense. Like she doesn't like him, but you know, it wasn't like he's responsible for like this. And now we know that he's responsible for it. So I am waiting, not patiently. I'm just waiting for her to take out all of that rage that she should have about Sam's death and him setting her up and all of these things. And I want him to die a horrific way. And if we could make it the same way Sam died, I'd be happy. <laughs> Where Selena's doing it herself. Pluck out her those hand. pretty eyes that he has. Silver. This book did such a great job of showing everything that was at stake once upon a time. Like just the magnitude of everything that Selena has lost. And it's going to make her payback, whatever you want to call it, that much sweeter when it finally gets to Arabin. But I kind of feel like at this point in the story, Selena is still not 100% like what exactly happened. No. She just knows that someone fucked up the plan. And so she has suspicions, but she doesn't know yet. And that was like the saving grace for Arabin for me, because if somebody took him out, I have to assume it was Arabin who took him out. Like he wasn't holding up his end of the bargain. I am there with Selena. I would like to be there with Selena as murder happens. We hope you enjoyed the second part of our discussion of the Assassin's Blade by Sarah J. Mass in our Throne of Glass read along. And stick around for next Tuesday because we'll be talking about part one of the Queen of Shadows and I know Tara is chomping at the bit to see where our girl is at and what her next steps are with how things ended in Air of Fire. So if you haven't checked out the rest of our discussions, I mean, we have Throne of Glass available. Now all of Assassin's Blades is out there. Uh, Crowd of Midnight and Air of Fire. All of that is out there. And I'm really just looking forward to see who she kills first. These are the important uh -huh. things. <laughs> We're halfway there now. Woohoo! Woohoo! Getting close. All right, we'll see you next week. Bye. Right. Bye.